and welcome. Uh, my name is Erin Drain. I'm with Olay and Obrigado, and we're so thrilled to welcome you to this experience. This is our 14th Olay and Obrigado experience, which I just cannot believe. We started this series last September, and it's just grown. But we're particularly excited because this is the last experience of 2021, mm -hmm. and with one of our dearest friends, uh, Chef Deborah Hansen. So we're here, and we're going to learn all about how to prepare the dish, the arroz negro. We'd love to hear in the chat box if you're also uh, cooking along or if you made the dish in advance. We're gonna be talking about three different wines, starting with the Roya, then Lerana, then the Goliardo Tinto, and we'll give you the details on those and all that good intel. Um, and then we're going to get all the tips on how to prepare this dish, why it works with the wine pairings. Um, before we do that, we just wanna introduce a couple other people on this call. So we've got Patrick Mata, founder of Ole and Obrigado, who's an old friend of Deborah's, and they're going to be talking about the food and wine with us tonight. And then we also have um, Ivan Espinoza Madrigal, who's representing Lawyers for Civil Rights, which is the organization that we're here raising funds for tonight. So thank you all for purchasing your tickets. We've already raised well over $700 for the organization, and we do have uh, an opportunity for you to donate more if you hear about their work and feel so inspired um, a little bit later. So. Yvonne, before we start talking food and wine, do you want to just give us a couple minutes, just two minutes on your organization, who you are, what you do? Thank you very much, Erin. It is a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, Patrick and uh, uh, Chef Hansen for convening us today. It is terrific to be here in partnership with Ole and Obrigado and with Taberna de Haro, uh, longtime friends and allies of lawyers for civil rights. We are a nonprofit and nonpartisan organization that provides free legal support to low-income um, immigrant communities and communities of color. We do this work um, in local places like in Massachusetts, but also uh, our work uh, has an impact across the country. We just came from a border delegation where we were looking at conditions at the border. Uh, we have also been extremely active during the pandemic, providing support for families in everything from making sure that they have educational opportunities for kids, uh, despite the digital divide, uh, because many families cannot connect in the same way that we're connecting this evening and that we can have this cultural and social experience, which is just terrific. Um, and so making sure that we are there to provide resources and free legal support to families in need um, who are struggling um, in the midst of the pandemic or, or in light of the immigration crisis that continues to unfold. And so these issues are near and dear to us at Lawyers for Civil Rights, and I think they connect with many of the themes that we will be talking about today, which is to experience new cultures and to experience um, opportunities, even if we're not traveling, of lessons learned through cultural exchanges and travel. And so we look forward to being here tonight to learn more from uh, Chef Hansen and to connect um, really meaningfully tonight with all of our participants and particularly with Ole and Obrigado. Thank you for having us here this uh, evening and we look forward to this magnificent uh, meal and magnificent wines tonight. Thank you so much and thanks for your time and for the great work that your organization is doing. Um, Chef Hansen did select this organization because of the strong connection that immigrants have to the restaurant industry. Um, but first, we just want to cover a couple ground rules before we make the rest of the introductions. So use the chat box to answer any questions or ask your questions, excuse me, and we'll be answering them in there and periodically pausing to ask chef to demonstrate or maybe show us a technique or something that you want to see, especially if you're cooking along at home. We are going to taste the wines in the order of the Roya, Lerana, and Goliardo Tinto, but part of the fun of this experience is you playing with your food. So start tasting, start, you know, start sipping, and we'll make sure you get to learn about the wines um, a little bit later. And then last but not least, we will open up for a Q&A at the end and allow you to turn on your cameras, unmute yourself, say hi. We want to see your faces. We're so happy that you're here. And that's one of the most fun parts of these sessions. So buckle in, get ready. Um, I'm going to have Patrick introduce Ole and Obrigado and talk about the series and then introduce his friend, Chef Deborah Hansen. Thank you, Erin. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, 
I'm very excited to be here. I've been cooking this uh, arroz negro. I love this recipe because it's so simple. Um, thank you, Deborah, for sharing this, this great recipe with us. Um, and, you know, we, we are importers of artisanal wines from Spain and Portugal. And we take a lot of pride in, in giving back. And that's why we created this experience of uh, pairing wine with food while giving back to important causes. And we love, we love pairing, pairing wine with food. This is, it's one of the most magical things that there, there is out there. You know, a lot of people love food. A lot of people like wine. When you're able to put them together, um, it's, it's something magical. And a lot of people see them as two different realities, but the way I see wine is as a liquid ingredient that can amplify the flavors of food. And this, you know, fun experiences are all about trying to understand and have fun with this reality of amplifying the flavors of food through wine. Um, Deborah is a great friend, one of the most passionate chefs I know. Uh, not only passionate, but very talented and, and someone who is extremely interested in, in traditional Spanish cuisine. I don't know of any other chef in America who is more versatile in traditional Spanish cuisine. And we met, I think, 15 years ago. I went to, to Boston and met Deborah, and I was totally blown away by this cuisine. And since then, we've been good friends. She has come to Spain with us one or two times. I don't know, two times, right? And so I feel privileged to, to be here with you today, Deborah, and, and you know, learn about this incredible dish. The pleasure is all mine. It's gonna be so fun. Yes, and we have three wines. You know, most people think that seafood is always connected to white wines. Um, you know, reds don't have anything to do with seafood, so I'm happy that we're showing a red wine tonight, which is incredible how it goes with this dish. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know what are the best wines to go with, with, um, with rice, you know, rice dishes, whether it's a paella or an arroz caldoso or an arroz negro, which is what we're doing tonight. A lot of people, you know, or Im imagine you're making a risotto at home, what's the best wine? So uh, this is a starch rich dish that has seafood, you know, and what are the best wines? So we're gonna discuss a little bit what rules you can take into account to best pair. And, and now, Deborah, I'll give you the microphone. I think we need to learn a little bit more about this dish and why you created this recipe and how, what are the tricks? And, and I hope many of you made the dish tonight. If not, um, you will, I'm sure, uh, very soon because it's so good. We've got about a dozen people so far who are cooking the dish, which is so exciting. Um, so I'm sure we'll have some great questions for you, Chef. So let's okay. on, turn it over. All right, excellent. Hi, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I love what Ole and Obrigado represent, such a great, uh, huge array of, of Spanish and also Portuguese wine. I mostly indulge in the Spanish ones. Um, the reason I love this dish is because it is technically a paella, but it is an off the beaten trail paella and still traditional. Um, I love to humbly consider myself an ambassador of Spain's authentic cuisine and interesting wines. And Paella is one of the most bastardized dishes. It became popular when Franco, Generalissimo Franco, opened up Spain's very closed doors back in the 60s to tourists. And this very simple, humble rice dish that was eaten along the Mediterranean suddenly was much loved by all these Northern Europeans that came down. And restaurateurs quickly learned they could make a lot of money by making it really fancy. <laughs> so it went from this humble Sunday dinner with very humble ingredients to having lots and lots of stuff in it. But to this day, Spaniards 
resent that. It's not about the stuff. It's about the stock. You need really good stock and you need uh, a, a minimum. You need to use a little restraint when it comes to paella. You don't put a ton of stuff in it. And by all means, you do not fluff up the rice. If you ever see a paella where the rice is all fluffed up, that's a bogus paella. It should be flat. You don't get to stir it. It's not a risotto. Uh, and it's definitely not a casserole. You can't throw anything in it. It cannot take the place of an American casserole. You have to select the ingredients very carefully and just one or two. And so tonight we're using squid and cuttlefish or just squid if you can't find cuttlefish, obviously that's fine. So arroz negro, one of my favorite paellas because it's so rich and intense and delicious. You'll find it in Spain anywhere from gray to charcoal to black. I, of course, being the intense person I am, I love the dark black one. Yeah, I made, I made one today. Today was charcoal for me, Lebra. Okay. Did, how, did, how did you like that one? It's good. It's good. But I would have liked to be darker, but I didn't put enough squid ink. Mm, yeah, don't but hold back on squid ink. But it's delicious. Good. Good. Yeah, so I'm telling you to use restraint. Don't put a ton of stuff in it. Uh, where your passion and your energy has to go is into your stock. And then your, your, your flavor, which in this case is the squid ink, which adds both texture because it's very buttery. And I'm sure any of you cooking at home mm -hmm. noticed it's, it has like, it's almost springy, you know, it's not just a liquid like ink from a pen. It has this great texture. And it's, to me, it's like um, the butter of the ocean. It's like oceanic butter. And I love it. And I love it. Mm. So I like that. Yeah. Butter of the ocean. That's butter bad. of the ocean. That's <laughs> You, you can question. trademark that. I think, Deborah, you can trademark that. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> one, uh, one question we have is with the squid ink, if people have some left over, how, how long does that keep that in a fridge at all? Uh, I think indefinitely. <laughs> it doesn't I think it's seem like butter. Like I think it's like <laughs> butter. I have had right. squid ink in my refrigerator for a year and it's good. Yeah, it's like salt cod. I always say keep some salt cod in your fridge because when the world ends, you'll have some protein. Um, the squid ink is the same thing and yeah, just keep it, just keep it, use it. If you make pasta or make another rice dish or try making a light gray one and see if you like the light gray. Do you want to go over the ingredients a little bit? And, and, and I see you're cheating because you know, you didn't make the, you didn't make the fish stock, you know, I, I didn't, I, I didn't. You. I'm supporting our friend Angelica. <laughs> Good, I'm supporting good. Angelica we, we and know, I'm sure a lot of Angelica people from the Spaniards. Exactly. Exactly. So I, I'm a fanatic about making stock. I love steaming up all my windows and filling my kitchen with smells of stocks. But I also recognize that maybe a lot of my friends cooking out there don't share that same four hour passion. So um, mm -hmm. in order to cook like everyone else tonight, I decided to use Angelica from Despania's stock and it smells and tastes amazing. It's super fishy in the best possible way. So the first thing you need is really good olive oil, always excellent extra virgin Spanish olive oil, the best you can buy. Um, mm -hmm. Finely chopped garlic, grated tomato, which uh -huh. this is another great thing about this, um, about this recipe is there's almost no chopping. You chop your garlic, but the tomato literally you grate by going like this. Mm. It's it couldn't be easier. No chopping. So I that's put it that. on the blender. I put it on the blender at low speed. There you go. There you go. Okay. Even easier. Even easier. <laughs> even easier. Even easier. Um, I made Patrick a homemade alioli just because I didn't make stock. I mean a homemade alioli. Wow. Which is look at that. Yeah. In my mortar and pestle that I bought in Mallorca, Spain, made of olive wood. Look at that. Oh, yeah. I have beautiful saffron to put mm. in the stock. In the stock, nice. I have fresh squid chopped and squid tentacles. Okay. I'm a person. I'm a chef that loves taking people a little out of their comfort zone. And if people turn up their nose at squid legs, I say, uh, 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 no, you got to try them. So we're having squid legs tonight. <laughs> Another one of my mottos is: it's always a great day when you try something new. We're going to garnish with um, roasted red pepper, nice. which, I, which I did make. However, you can feel free to buy roasted red peppers. Yeah, I think the España sells them too. Yeah, definitely. And do you like, uh, do you like piquillo peppers for that, Chef? Um, I love piquillo peppers and absolutely they work on this. Absolutely. 
and I'm using um, bomba rice, but if you, if you don't have access to bomba, you can get it through Dispan. If you don't have access to bomba, you can use arborio perfectly fine. So we have mm -hmm. our rice and, uh, and that's that. Should we start cooking or do we have to do other Absolutely. things Let, Let's get started. Let's it. start, let's do oh, this. I wanna see you in let's... action. All right, here I go, and, here and, I go. And uh, I would like to just say a few things here about the wines. Um, I don't know if everyone has the three wines or two wines or one wine, but, and some of you have already cooked the dish. So I've been going back and forth between the wines and see how, you know, each wine complements the food and each, each wine is bringing something out of the dish. And there are a lot of different ways of pairing wine with food. Some wines amplify the flavors, some wines are complementary with the dish. Some wines are contrasting with the flavors like salt and sweet, for example, one of the best pairings out there is Sauternes, sweet wine, with foie gras, beautiful. Or Tokai, which is a sweet wine, uh, with oysters. You know, that's a, a pairing that most people cannot imagine that it can work, and it's such a beautiful thing. And that's a pairing of contrast. You're pairing two opposite spectrums of flavor, sweet with salty. And Patrick, can I interject? Because there's one that I yeah. love that's strictly Spanish. I love um, a Spanish moscatel made in the solar system with mm -hmm. anchovies. With anchovies. Okay, you see, I've never done that. So you, I, that's you, now you my should. bucket list. That's on my bucket list. And, and you know, we, we're going to make uh, an moscatel in Malaga, Deborah. This is news Ooh, to everyone. That is big news. Yay. Uh, we, we were talking to a farmer in Malaga. I'm from Malaga and, and, and you know, my, my family produced Moscatel wines in Malaga for, for almost a century. Wow. I don't think my, I knew that. It's one of my dreams to produce a wine. So I, I, like, I like that Moscatel goes well with, with, um, with sardines, you know, this is good. Mm, with anchovies, yeah. Anchovies. Mm. That's great. Hey chef, Good. real quick, you're 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 taking care of your garlic right now. It looks like, and I know you had some advice for everyone at home for this part of the process. So we want really sweet garlic. We don't want toasted garlic. Toasted garlic is definitely a flavor that shows up a lot in Spanish cuisine. It's wonderful, but not in a paella. You want sweet garlic, so you want low heat, um, in plenty of olive oil, and you're you're trying to tease out like those sweet, sexy flavors of the garlic, not the uh, zippy, crunchy, toasty notes that can come from very cooked garlic. So we want to keep it, keep it low. And then once we add our tomato, there will be enough water in the pan to keep the garlic from getting too crispy. So we really, we don't want it to get brown. You know, we just want it to be cooked. All right, so low heat with your garlic in this case. And that's just garlic and olive oil. Is there any salt in the pan? Nope, garlic and olive oil. All right. Easy peasy. Easy peasy, yeah. So that's what, three, three four, garlic? Four cloves, four. Four, cloves? Four, four big ones, Spanish style garlic, big. So if your garlic cloves are small, use six or eight, you know. You can never hurt a paella by putting extra garlic. That's my motto. I'm, I'm having dinner with some friends here and they agree that garlic go, goes, you know, is, is the best thing. So this is what, a four or five minute process? Oh, she's muted, one second. You're, I think you're on mute right now, Deborah. That's, I think I, I think we accidentally muted her. Give, give me one sec, we'll unmute you. Mm -hmm. well, this is good. Deborah, you're gonna have to reach in your pocket and unmute yourself. Sorry, we can't. Looks like we can't do it manually. Trigger finger. Oh uh, yeah. There we go. Now wow. we're back. I hear you. I don't know how that happened. I don't think I touched my uh, my buttons, but okay. It was me. <laughs> Sorry. 
it's, okay. it's, not a Zoom, it's not a Zoom meeting without someone being on mute by accident. Sorry. About right, that. Right, Sorry, right, right, right. As you were both saying, please continue. Okay, it's been three minutes. Uh, it's time for me to add the, t the grated tomato. Mm -hmm. And tomato, we want to get thick and sweet and, and dark. So that takes, that takes another few minutes. We'll just slowly do this. And believe it or not, I fell in love with this dish on my very first trip to Spain, which was back in 1983. Uh, and I fell in love with Spain within five minutes. I, I and it was all through my nose. I fell in love with Spain through my nose. I loved, suddenly I was just, my senses were assaulted with the smell of like strong coffee and exotic tobacco and frying potatoes and simmering omelets and cologne. And I hadn't even left the airport yet. And I was already smitten. And on that same trip, I, I got to try this dish. That was back in 1983. And now fast forward to 1998, and that's when I opened Taberna de Aro in the hopes of bringing the, the authentic cuisine of Spain to the United States. Not the touristy version, not the Americanized version, but the authentic uh, cuisine of, of Spain. That's, and that's what Taberna de Aro is all about since 1998. And you, you're, you're, you're going to publish a cookbook very soon, no? Deborah? I'm hoping to, I, I'm hoping to, I need a publisher. <laughs> I, I need a publisher, but yeah, I have. Uh, We're not in the publishing business, but we will publish your book. You know, we will do whatever uh, we can to to bring it to the world. You're so sweet, Patrick. Maybe you should go in the publishing business. So that's a great that's a great uh, segue to plug quickly. So one of the things that we're so excited about, you know, Chef Hansen is a trailblazer, starting a Spanish restaurant in 1998 when the landscape. There wasn't Spanish restaurants in, in every big city, just like we see now. And so, you know, we're, we're so excited to hear that you've got a collection of recipes coming out. If you want to stay on top of that news, um, definitely you're going to want to sign up for uh, the Taberna de Aro newsletter. And we'll, we'll show you a link uh, with a QR code so that you can do that uh, just a little bit later. And I will also mention that, Chef, you contributed a recipe to our cookbook for El Camino del Abarino this year which was also a squid ink dish. Um, and we also love it with Albarino. So there seems to be a trend, <laughs> but- um, um, so Again, I like taking people out of their comfort zone, but I look like a one trick pony, a one ink pony. <laughs> well, when you call it the butter of the sea, I think we get why the, uh, the appeal holds. Yeah. Love it, love it. So some people are drinking the wines. Um, they're, all of them are so unique, but all of them have something in common. All the wines are very salty. I don't know if you can taste that, but this is a, a, a dish of the ocean. We're working with fish here. And, and, and all the wines come are very are grown. The, the vineyards, the vines, the grapes are grown near the, the water, near the ocean, near the Atlantic Ocean. And all of them have an element of salinity that comes across. Some wines more than others, but all of them have this salty element, which salt, you know, is a natural ingredient to amplify flavor. And, and that's why it's such a good ingredient for this dish, no? All, all these, these salty, salty wines. Um, and some of you have the three of them. So the Berroya, I'm tasting right now, it's the wine that has more, most citrus element. It's like a, it's almost like a lemon. It's like a lemon with salt. And that's why it's such a great pairing with this dish, but also it's a great pairing with oysters. It's a great pairing with sushi. It's a great pairing with anything that likes citrus and salt. Uh, so Berroya, I pair a lot with many different seafood related dishes and dishes that like starch like you know like a paella like a risotto it's always so good um patrick i really like it with bluefish mm. grilled bluefish strong mm, flavors right. yeah it stands up to strong bluefish believe it or not yeah it's, it's a very versatile wine i think of totally the 
150, 200 wines that we import. I think it's one of the most versatile wines with food. It, it's always, you know, this citrus salty element, no, that this wine has. And you can almost smell the ocean in this in this glass. For those of you that have the wine, you can you can smell it. It's, it brings you a little bit to the Atlantic Ocean. The other wine that we have here is Leirana, which is another wine from the ocean. It's made with a different grape, it's Albariño. This is from Galicia, northwest of Spain. It's a salty wine, but it has a little bit more weight, a little bit of more texture. I don't know if you guys realize that, but it's a little bit more weight, but salty at the same time. And it really amplifies the flavors of the paella of, of Chef here. I was very impressed with that today. And Leirana is a beautiful producer, small production. Rodri, Rodri is the winemaker, uh, very talented producer in the Northwest of Spain. He makes one of the best Albariños in, in the country and he's known as the king of Albariño. So this is a, a great producer to know. And Albariño is becoming very fashionable in the US. It's a perfect uh, white wine for people who love Sauvignon Blanc, people who love, um, you know, Sancerre, um, you know, light wines, white wines that have crispiness and, and you know, it's beautiful for that. And then we have this red wine, which, it's also a red wine grown, it's made by Rodri Mendez, same producer that makes the Leirán Albariño, same winemaker, same vineyard, but it's uh, made with red grapes in Galicia. And maybe this wine on its own, you're like, wow, this is a weird wine. You know, I've never had a wine, a red wine that is salty and maybe so acidic, but it's so beautiful with this dish. No, it has this herbal quality, for those of you that like Cabernet Franc, for those of you who like Gamay from, you know, uh, the area of south of Burgundy, this is beautiful, you know? This is a, a wine that has a lot of life and brings, you know, a lot of uh, earthy, earthy notes mm. and this tart, there's like a tart element that is almost like a reset button with the starch of the rice, no? So, I'm kind of describing why, you know, uh, my feelings no, about these wines. I don't know what your feelings are, but that, you know, we try a lot of different red wines. You don't want a red wine that has tannin. You don't want a Cabernet Sauvignon or a Carignan or, you know, you don't want big red wines with this dish. You want something lighter. But, but uh, Deborah, now you're adding the rice, no? Yes, I added my rice because my sofrito was getting, uh, you know, nice and cohesive and cooked and most of the water had cooked out. And now I'm so sorry to cut the Goliardo thing short. We'll go back to Goliardo. No, no, it's an we, amazing we have wine. lots of time. We have lots of time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're sauteing the rice, which will coat it with a little bit of oil, infuse it with flavor and make it cook better. And mm -hmm. you can see it's all homogenous now. And now what I'm gonna do with a little, little tiny bit of the stock that I have left over, I'm gonna add it to my saffron. And with a, with a pestle, I'm gonna just like tease out some extra flavor from the saffron, just to make sure it gets nice and infused. We get every bit of the flavor of this very expensive spice. The world's most expensive spice goes in this dish, not for color, not for color. As some people think, they think that the saffron is just to dye the rice. It's not, it's to flavor it. And the amazing thing is that even through all the ink, you can still taste the saffron. Um, wonderful thing. And saffron is one of Spain's fabulous ingredients. We do minute. have a couple. We do have a couple questions for you, Chef. Um, one question is if you have a, a general rule of thumb for how much rice, like how much rice per person, let's say, we can see that the pan uh, is much larger and the rice doesn't even cover the bottom of the pan. So that's right. That's right. So very good question. You want to use 
half a cup of raw rice per guest. And you also want to make sure that you have far less uh, surface area of rice than you think you need. So you're right. Right now, it barely covers the bottom of the pan. If I spread it out like this, it it um, you see how it it barely covers the the, it's the bottom. Very of the pan, thin, but that's it's a very great. thin layer. Not a very it's thin a layer. Very thin layer. If you get a thick layer, it's not it's not going to be good. Because when you do it this squid. way, all the rice cooks more evenly, right? Exactly. And if you have it a thick layer, you're going to end up with soggy rice. Some of it's going to be too cooked and some of it won't be cooked enough. So mm -hmm. you, you don't want soggy rice. And why do you use bomba or, or what, why is that so important? There are so many types of, of rices out there. Why do you want to use yeah. bomba or arborio? You want short grain. That's the important thing. Mm -hmm. Short grain. And uh, the thing about bomba is it absorbs, it's very absorbent and it absorbs so much stock. And that's a great thing for flavor. It's, uh, it's a dangerous thing for food cost when you're running a restaurant like I am. But it's a great thing for flavor because you're just infusing it with that much more flavor. The arborio tends to soak up just a little bit less. I just whisked my ink into my stock. And now I'm gonna pour it in. I can smell my rice. It's starting to smell a little toasted. And mm. ooh, look at all that yummy sea butter on the bottom of my measuring cup. <laughs> and right. we, paella is a dish that you do not stir once you get it to this point. So you make sure everything looks the way you want it to look. Your, your, your squid is arranged how you want it to be arranged. Like if you're making a, a paella with chicken now is when you would arrange your chicken legs in a decorative fashion or arrange your clams around the edges, whatever it is. Preferably not both, you're not supposed to mix. Um, and then we can't stir again, that's the rule. That's the paella rule, no more stirring. We don't wanna be fluffed up, we want flat because we are going for authenticity and deliciousness. That's our motto here. Now when you, right? when you stir the rice, if, if you were to do that, basically the rice will break down right and it will become mushy right is, yeah is that that's when you stuff? release exactly patrick you're a good cook you know these things so uh -huh. that's why risotto is such a pleasant thing because we stir and stir and we release all that starch and we get like sauce soupy sauce and rice all in one great fabulous dish i'm not knocking risotto paella mm -hmm. is very different you want each grain of rice to have firmness and texture and have its own little identity if you will mm -hmm. so and what you did of of toasting the rice, no, before you added the, the, the stock, that also holds the grain more intact, no? The, exactly. The grain will not break down as easily, no? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm chef, gonna turn, it, yes. Sorry about that. In your, in the recipe, um, it sounds like the fish, the seafood was added before the rice, but do yes. you like adding this, the rice first for that toasted element? Um, it, it kind of depends. Yeah, sometimes I do because the, the squid, squid by nature is filled with water and it would have kind of ruined the, the toasting and frying aspect of it. Meat actually works better because then you have extra meat juices and meat fat in there. So with the squid, I decided to do the rice first and then put the squid in. Also because the squid doesn't need to be um, cooked any longer, like 20 minutes is perfect to cook squid. If you're doing big chicken legs, obviously you need more than 20 minutes. So it's good to like really brown them first, but with squid, it's going to be done in a heartbeat. So I like, I just put it in after I know the recipe says to put it in before, but I have techniques, you know, <laughs> so you did just say you're turning down the heat. No, I turned it up now to yeah. like get a good, strong boil going. And then I'm going to turn it down so that it doesn't, you know, do overkill, but for much of the time it's going to be on medium heat. Then when we can start to hear it crackle, we got to listen in. When we hear it crackle, that's when we're going to turn it down low and let it finish very gently so it doesn't burn. But we do want a crust on the bottom. We want socarret, which we're going to scrape and eat later. That's the best part. In Madrid, that's, they call it the- That's um, an art. That's an art. Oh Doing yeah, that, it's so hard to do. Is, it's not easy. I've been making not paella easy. for so long and I sometimes get it wrong. So. We want to learn really? from you how to make socarrat. Socarrat is the caramelization, no? The caramelization of the rice, no? Yeah, yeah. So it's the not crisp burnt. bottom. Right. It's crispy, caramelized, 
Yeah. It's sweet, it's sweet, it's beautiful texture. Mm. And it's intensely flavored. It's like all the concentrated flavors there. And so if you're sitting around in, at the table in a family eating your paella, of course you eat all your paella first and then everyone goes back and scrapes with their fork <laughs> and with their spoon and eats the bottom and that's, and crunches it. And it goes so well with the wine because it's really intensely salty it's and savory. It's the best and part. It's, the it's best a really the fun part. Yeah, it's a really remember, fun part. And uh, I remember as a kid, my father will always, you know, wait until everyone had finished to eat the soca rat, you know? And yeah. that was his favorite part of the paella. Mm. Right, right. It is, and that's a, again, like a little brand of authenticity that now you all know how to achieve, or you will in a few yes. minutes. And do you do you taste the salt now, or because if, if, you, if it boils all the way, then you cannot correct the salt anymore, no? How do you do that? Well, let's taste it now and see how the salt is. Um, the uh, sea butter is quite salty. This is pretty salty. So in the recipe, I do call for three quarters of a teaspoon of salt. However, it really depends on how salty your broth is, how okay. salty your fish is, how salty your squid ink is. So you really just have to yeah, use your instinct. I tasted that, it was a little salty, but I think it could, it, it could take a little more because paella is a salty dish, you know? Spanish mm. food tends to be, mm. um, salty and i chuck that up to the spaniards like lust for life you know things are strong now do you while while the by the uh, arroz negro is cooking do you want to show us um how you make this incredible alioli sauce that i made that is so delicious um sure you have you have two options you have the old-fashioned option which is okay. the primitive option which is when you pound garlic and salt and you add oil a little bit at a time or you put it in your blender which is what i did i just put it in this lovely bowl to be cute <laughs> i like that <laughs> yeah and i'm good. actually gonna i'm actually gonna put it back in the refrigerator because in my hot steamy kitchen it's getting uh it's getting a little loose so it's going back in the fridge okay and alioli is a, you know, sounds like it could be pretty fast to make if you're doing the blender method. How long can people keep it? Not that we usually have leftover alioli, of course. It can keep for four or five days in your refrigerator, even though, yes, it's raw egg. It's got so much salt and oil is a preservative and lemon is a preservative. It's, it's fine. Um, and I was telling Patrick earlier with my little bit of leftover alioli that I made the other day, I used that as the base for Caesar salad dressing. So I just pounded in some anchovies, mm. some Worcestershire sauce, some black pepper, a little more olive oil, a little more lemon juice and made like the Caesar salad of my lifetime. So it's, that's a really good thing to do with alioli that you might not think of. It's great on steamed vegetables. It's great on sandwiches. It's great on grilled cheese. And it's a great base for Caesar salad. I highly recommend. So this is what you're allowed to do with paella. You can't stir but you, you move your pan around to make sure that everybody's getting, see right now you can see this circle of bubbles. That mm -hmm. means this part of the pie is definitely boiling and getting hot. What about over here? We can't stir, so we move our pan so that we take mm -hmm. advantage of the heat over here so that this part gets just as much heat and cooking opportunity. Mm -hmm. Jeff, what size pan is that that you're using? This is a paella for four size pan. <laughs> Looks like a paella for eight people. <laughs> no. 400 people. <laughs> no. Now, you, have, you have one burner or two burners on? Right now, just one burner going. I could turn another burner on. Mm. Get the edge over there. It's a I big size we... paella, so I'm sure you can hit two burners at the same time. No? Yeah. All right. Thanks, Patrick, for the tip. Good idea. No, no, I don't know. I don't know. I'm... Looks like a big paella. Mm. Um, it's it's actually not that big. It's about sixteen inches mm -hmm. at the at the most, maybe fourteen inches. So I would like I would like to hear a little bit the the people. No, what 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 is everyone drinking? How, how many people are drinking Berroya, this Chacolí wine from the Basque country? Uh, this Chacolí is, is a you know a wine a white wine of low alcohol, high acid lots of salty water, uh, a little bit sour, like a lemon. I, I wonder what people, you know, think about this wine. If some of you have made this dish, 
Um, how do you like it with the with the rice? Any any feedback? You know, I love to hear what people are thinking. So Sarah, Sarah is drinking Berroya. I love this wine. It's it's a wine that very artisanal, only like a thousand cases produced for the world. Um, you know, not a lot of people know about this wine, but it's to me incredible. So so versatile with with food, and not only with you know this you know a rose negro, but also a regular paella, also oysters, anything seafood. And chef is drinking the the chocolate out of a very traditional glass. Can you show us again on the uh, on the screen? That yeah. flat bottomed glass, uh, which came from your restaurant, you said. Yes, um, actually, this one's in my house. It's one of the shorter ones. Um, a chacolina glass and a cider glass should be a little bit taller, but these are the ones I have at home. It's actually a chateo glass. It's meant for like just a little splash of um, red wine mm -hmm. up in the Basque country, but it's the perfect glass for chacolina because you're, you're meant to pour your chacolina from on high to wake up the effervescence and get it really sparkly. But those are more the Getadiaco chacolinas and Patrick's chacolina here is Vizcaya. And they are, they're different. They're not quite as effervescent and they have a little more depth, um, a little more glycerin. They're not as like hard edged as their Getariaco Chacolinas. They're different. They're really, they're wonderful. And they're, they're a little more versatile when it comes to food pairing, honestly. Mm. Yes, I, they're, you know, Chacolí is like saying white burgundy. There are many different types of right. white burgundies, no? In, in the Getaria region, it's more bubbly, and in this area where we are, Vizcaya, closer to Bilbao, this area, uh, Chacolis, are flat. They don't have any, you know, bubbly aspect to it. So they pour it as a regular white wine. But I'm, I'm happy to hear the comments of the people. Jeffrey, I, I agree with you. Berroya, to me, is a standout. And I highly recommend you try this with oysters one day. Um, a lot of people do Moscaday with oysters. Try or, you know, uh, Sancerre. Try this. Try Berroya with oysters. You, I think you, you will. And, and try them also with a Moscaday and a Chablis. Try, the, do the three, the three wines and, and you will see how lovely Berroya is. Um, and and if you're trying Chablis, notice that the Chablis cost you a hundred dollars, <laughs> and the Berroya did not. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And this is a uh, all in one state. It's a beautiful place for those of you who are now about to get on a plane to go to Spain. And if you happen to go to the Basque Country, let me know. Email us at Olean Obrigado, and we will hook you up to visit this estate, one of the most beautiful places in the world. When you're there, you think you're in Switzerland. It's all these rolling hills and you can see the Atlantic Ocean. The vineyards are so, so beautiful. Uh, actually, they, they put a picture I see here. Uh, one of the screens is a photo and this is looking north. Uh, if you switch to the south, you can see the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and this is only um, half, half a mile away from the Atlantic Ocean. And as you can see, we're up and high. So all the winds of the Atlantic Ocean are, you know, um, hitting these, these uh, slopes of vineyards. And some of that saltiness in the environment, in the air, stick into the skin of the grapes. And when you harvest these grapes, some of that saltiness is in the wine. And again, for those of you who have this wine, you can smell it and you can taste it in the, tin, in the tip of your tongue. You can taste the salt of the ocean. And in fabulous acidity along the side of your mouth, really makes your mouth water, which is great because it then it makes your food flavors come back again and again. Yeah, it's, it amplifies, not flavor. So I, and now if you like, we can talk a little bit about Leirana. Leirana is 
is Albariño, one of my favorite white grapes, and it's extremely diverse and also versatile. Diverse because it depends on okay. where this Albariño is grown, it's totally different. You can taste five Albariños blind, and all of them will taste totally different. Uh, in fact, we did in New York one <laughs> uh, an event, Deborah was there. It was a yeah. blind tasting competition. You tricked us. You tricked us. <laughs> blind tasting competition. And, and we tasted four Alvariños blind. And, and people had to guess which wine is this, which grape, you know? And everyone thought this is, you know, uh, Viura from Spain. This is Verdejo. This is uh, Garnacha. This is, all of them were Alvariños. But that, that's Alvariño. It depends on where it's grown. It tastes where the where that place is from, and every place is different. The the rainfall, the type of soil, and those elements impart character and flavor to the wines. And Alvariño is able to communicate that that identity to each wine. So you can have four different Alvariños from four different places, and you don't know you're tasting the same grape. So that's that's the element of diversity. And then you have this element of versatility, which is extremely versatile with food. And, and it amplifies flavor because it has acid and it has salt. And any good dish of food, you need acid to amplify the flavor and you need salt to amplify also the flavor. So it's a white wine that is, you know, so perfect for pairing with food. And it has a little bit more texture than the Chacolí. And this is a photo of a vineyard. The, the, the vineyards there are very high. You, you, you're like six, seven feet high. And why is it so high? Because it's very rainy. It rains a lot over there. And the only way you can keep the grapes dry without the fungus and the humidity problems related to rainfall, it's by raising the trellis very high and then the winds dry out the environment. Uh, most areas in Spain, the vines grow very close to the ground. In Galicia, where we are now in the northwest of Spain, the, the, the vines are very high purposely to dry, to help the winds to dry, you know, the, the, the skins on the grapes. This is where, where we are now in Rias Baixas. Um, so the Chacolí is near Bilbao, okay, in the northeast, right, over here. And then in the northwest, you have Galicia, Rias Baixas. That's where the Leirana Alvariño and the Goliardo Tinto are produced. So both wines are Atlantic. And these are the two places in Spain where it rains the most. So the trellis system is very similar, very high on both areas. It's incredible how such a small country is so different. You go from, from Rivera del Duero, you know, you can see it, Burgos, Castilla Leon, Tierra de Leon, that whole area. This is about 12 inches of rainfall a year. And from here to Galicia, where Rias Baixas is, you can drive in four or five hours. In Rias Baixas is 70 inches of rainfall a year. From 70, to 12. It's day and night, totally different, um, you know, um, geography, uh, things look so different. In Rias Baixas, you think you're in Scotland, you know, everything is green, people play the bagpipes, and then you go to Rivera del Duero, everything is dry, you know, people look different, they have the boinas, you know, it's a totally different universe. And, and that's such a small country and so diverse. Yeah. Okay, Deborah, so what are we doing now? Let's check on that rice. Um, we're listening is what we're doing now and we're hearing crackling. So I turned the heat down a little because I can hear the crackling and I can see by just the few random bubbles here, my, my beautiful cameraman is gonna give us a close up here. Um, see those bubbles and hear, can, can you hear it? crackling and my spidey senses are telling me I need just like a tiny bit more stock 
just a tiny bit. Could you and add water if there's if you're all yep. done with the stock and you need more? Absolutely, you can add water. Absolutely, just add a little bit of water. Um, I always have chicken stock in the refrigerator because that's the kind of girl that I am. I never, never have a chicken stock free refrigerator. So I would add some of that if I will if I ran out of stock. We did have uh, a question on the amount of saffron. Uh, someone asked again how much that was that was that you infused into the stock previously. So the recipe says about a teaspoon and that would be loose, like not a packed down teaspoon because that's a lot of saffron. You can also just take a generous pinch. Uh, sometimes in the store you can buy like this tiny little vial of saffron and it's meant to be like for one dish and that's fine. It's as much as you want to use really. The more you use, it's a fabulous flavor. You, you can almost never use too much, but it's really expensive. So it's up to you. But I would say a generous pinch or a loose teaspoon. Can you, can you explain to us what made you kind of Spidey Sense realize that you needed to add a little more liquid to your paella just for people at home to understand? Sure, I can hear it crackling, but I can see on the top that I have rice grains that are still opaque and Dan's gonna show us here. Um, see over here, you can see that the rice is still opaque in the center, meaning it's not cooked all the way through. However, now I'm smelling the toast I'm smelling it. So that means it's getting close to done. So I'm gonna turn the heat down a little more because we do not want burned. We want like dark brown toasty bottom, but not a burned bottom. Who wants a burned bottom? So. Good, to, good advice for life and for, for cooking, of course. Exactly, exactly. So let your nose and your ears help you with this too. Now that I've turned the heat down, the crackling is, is, is muted and then I'm gonna taste it. I'm gonna taste over here where I can see that they're not quite, mm, it's really close. And it's beautifully seasoned and spiced and salted. So I'd be okay to add a little water. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna add a tiny bit of water since I've run out of stock. One of the things that I think is great to show about this dish, and thank you so much for showing us, is it doesn't take all day to make. No, it's, no, 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 no. Commitment, but it's actually very simple to cook at home, and you know, on a regular very simple. stove at home. Yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, if if you cook on a regular basis at home, like I do, every time you make a dinner, like if you make fish for dinner, take the scraps, throw them in a pan with a piece of celery, a piece of onion a carrot, salt and pepper, and let that simmer while you clean up, while you do your dishes, while you hang with your kids, while you do mm. your thing. And then in two hours, you have fish stock. Strain it, you put it in your, in your fridge overnight, freeze it if you want, and then you always have fish stock. So never make a protein without making stock. When you roast a chicken, same thing. Take the meat off the bone right after you eat, Put that in a container so that you have quick grabbable protein at all all times in your fridge very important for hard-working people and then you have stock and you have it in your freezer or you have it in your fridge and you can make everything everything's better if you have stock you know your rice is better your pasta is better everything's better so incorporate stock making into your life also because the bones of animals is where we can get an incredible amount of calcium and other minerals. Like our bones get strong from the same thing that made the animal's bones strong. Make sure you add acid, lemon or wine or vinegar, and that will um, cause the, the, the calcium to be leached out of the bones. And it's the best nutrition there is. So never throw protein scraps away. Always make stock and then make paella. <laughs> That's great. That's, those are my two cents. So I, 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 I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the tannin aspect of these wines. No? All of these wines do not have any tannin whatsoever. Uh, obviously the red has a little bit more this dry component, but they're not big, powerful wines. And that's what you need for a dish like this. Um, if you were to have a big red wine with this dish, you know, it will not pair so well. It will not amplify the flavors. The best thing to, to do with this dish is, again, work with salt, work with acid, and these wines have these two components, no? And that's kind of one of the takeaways with rice dishes in general. You don't want to use wines that are 
big and powerful and muscular. You want something light that has acid, that amplifies flavor, and in this case, salinity. Um, so that's, um, you know, and, and you can do so many different things with these wines. You can do, you know, all sorts of rice dishes from risottos to paellas to also pasta dishes. Like uh, you can do, for example, with the Berroya, a carbonara pasta dish is incredible because those dishes don't like tanning. They like salt, they like acid to contrast the starchedness and the fat of the bacon in the case of the carbonara. And Patrick, I'd love to add here, all the things you're saying are true, the salt and the acid, but fruit, like these wines have this fruit presence that's beautiful. It's restrained, it's not overripe mm. fruit, it's not sweet fruit, it's perfect fruit that adds just a, a voluptuosity and a volume to the wines that also make them very food friendly. Fruit is a food. <laughs> mm -hmm. These are some incredible tips. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm learning so much before we actually open up the session and, and let people come on camera and talk about the final dish and maybe the last pairing. I do want to remind us one of the reasons why we're here. So Elena Regato Experiences was started in part to continue on with our ethos of giving back to really great causes. And as you will remember, um, tonight's cause is Lawyers for Civil Rights. So I just want to invite um, Yvonne back on to just once again remind us about the great work that you're doing, maybe talk about something recent that you're really excited about. And if you look on your screens, you can see that there's a QR code. If you hold your phone up to that QR code uh, using your camera setting, you'll actually be taken to a link where you can donate directly. So we definitely encourage you if you're if you're moved by this cause to um, go on and keep donating. But Yvonne, let's hear from you for a few minutes before we uh, look at the last bit of this amazing rice dish here. Thank you very much, Erin. And I wanna again thank uh, Patrick and Orlando Brigado for having us here today. Lawyers for Civil Rights is proud to join forces here today with Orlando Brigado and also with the amazing Chap Hansen, who has walked us through an incredible, incredible dish. I mean, just look at it on the screen. It's fabulous. It's absolutely loving, lovely. And, uh, and the wine pairings, just terrific. And to get to discover these uh, really amazing treats and cultural elements is just uh, worth um, uh, an incredible, incredible um, uh, amount of time and effort and and it's well worth uh, well worth it and uh, as you're suggesting Aaron a uh, part of the reason why we're gathered here today is also because Oreno Brigado has generously uh, donated proceeds from tonight's evening to support lawyers for civil rights and the free legal work we are providing to immigrants and people of color and low-income communities uh, much of this work, especially these days, as we're seeing so many things in the news, uh, especially at the border, is focusing on making sure that people who are newcomers to this country can be integrated successfully into our society. And nothing um, speaks volumes more than the amazing cultural experience that we have had tonight. Um, Chef Hansen is sharing an incredible recipe from Spain uh, along with the incredible wines that are being paired. And all of this is made possible through travel, through exploration, through adventures. Many of us are able to do that through our day-to-day -day life, um, especially pre-pandemic and those things are returning. But for many people, travel is not really something that they're doing out of business or pleasure. It's being done because they have to. And so making sure that they also have opportunities, that they are connected to uh, free legal support so that they can thrive is something that we at Lawyers for Civil Rights do every day and that we are proud to do with support from Chef Hansen from uh, her amazing restaurant um, in, in um, Brookline near Boston, Taberna de Haro, and also with support from Aliano Brigado. And so I wanna thank you for hosting us tonight. I wanna to invite folks to learn more about our work by visiting lawyersforcivilrights.org. And thank you for participating in this amazing evening, uh, which is allowing our work 
uh, to really continue fuels our mission and it allows us to continue to provide uh, free legal work and to strive for justice for the most uh, needy among us. And so I'm turning it back to Oleno Brigado and to Chef Hansen for the remainder of the evening. Thank, Thank you, Ivan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you. We love what you do. <laughs> and you are, you know, like a guardian angel for so many immigrants that do not have a voice, that do not know how to solve the problems that they have. They are so unprivileged, you know, in this country. We all know friends who are immigrants, who are not legal in this country, who, for example, have cancer and do not have access to a health insurance program. Even if they have the money and they want to pay for health insurance, they cannot have health insurance. And if they have cancer, you know, they have to pay out of pocket for, for you know, their cancer, um, you know, medicine and, and, and for, for chemo. And, and if, if people who are legal have a hard time paying for that, imagine a, a, an illegal immigrant who, who has this condition. So I, I, I'm so happy that we're helping um, your cause and, and bringing you to the spotlight. And I hope that, you know, many people feel, you know, generous to help and support the work that you do. Thank you for being here. Thank you, so you Patrick. Patrick. We, um, we are now entering the, the favorite part of the evening. So before we do that, I just want to give a little shout out to our giveaway. We love giveaways at Oleano Brigado. We love to keep engaging with you even after these sessions are over. So everyone who purchased a ticket tonight will receive a follow-up email with more information about ways that you can support Lawyers for Civil Rights, with ways that you can get connected and stay in touch with Chef Deborah at and to Bernard de Aro, and also make sure that you are going to find out about her cookbook right when it launches. And we also have a giveaway where we're going to help support our dear friends at Despania, who provided the food kits for this evening, with some gift cards. So the instructions will be in your email. So be sure to check your inbox later tonight. And you have a few days, but we'd love to engage with you on social media, whether it's Instagram or Facebook, uh, through a photo competition. So just keep your eye on that oh. inbox. Um, we'd love to see uh, some photos from you uh, having a good time tonight. And what we're going to do right now um, is we're going to actually let you uh, start your video um, so you can come on the screen and we're going to spotlight chef's video again so she can show us the final dish and then we can get to see uh what you made if you are joining us on camera um erin i didn't see the qr code to donate is it possible to show that on the screen because i was trying to take a photo and i couldn't sure thing we'll put it back up and everyone at this point in the in the evening if you want you can move to gallery view um which will also help you see more screens at once and that information will be in the follow-up email along with the recording of tonight's session so that you can make the dish again or you can share it with friends okay so what i'm doing is i'm i'm pinning pinning this image that's how i can see it on the screen This is great. Deborah, thank you so much. Eh? This is so fun. My pleasure. And I, I just want to say how much I'm loving the, the Goliardo, Tintas de Mar. It's violet scented. It has just the right amount of bitterness at the end. There's all these like exotic red fruits in it. it I love cool climate wines. I love Atlantic wines. And I, I, this I one cannot, is just- I was just thinking this wine for Thanksgiving, really good you know it has this tart quality right it brings me to to cape cod you know with with the with the cranberries cranberries right it doesn't you it's so so a little good. bit yeah it brings me to cape cod it brings me to the loire valley and it brings and, me to yes, galicia a little bit of, it's a, of black yeah. black crushed pepper a little bit yeah. of earthy tones 
it's, it's wonderful. So delightful and, and, and acid. It has this spark of, of acidity, you know? Yeah, it's great. It's very layered and very beautiful. And yet um, the texture is a little austere and lean. And I love that. I love that. I don't want my wine that I'm pairing with a, a complicated dish to be too voluptuous. I don't want it to be curvier than my food, you know? The Leirana is very curvy. On the other hand, this is a very voluptuous Albarino. It's really sexy and has this slippery texture. And Yeah, I love the like, texture. It has some yeah, weight. The, some weight. It's silky. Uh, the glycerin presence is just amazing. It makes it a very sensual experience. It has a heady aroma, like bleachy and a little bit of grapefruit skin. And it's a beautiful specimen of Albarino. It's really kind of like the quintessential Atlantic mm -hmm. Albarino. There are a lot of people here on the screen. I want to I wanna see who has cooked the, the arroz negro today. Yeah. Look Ooh. at this. Jeffrey, That's good great. photo. Very nice. Good photo. Let's see. Wow. Kathy, beautiful. JM, look at that. Hey, Kathy, like, I, I want to see that. Kathy, not, not so fast, not so fast. Oh, the arrow. Wow. Oh, arrow. That looks so good. And it's it's uh, smoking, so it's ready to eat. And Jennifer, how nice! Oh, where, Jennifer where, Goldfinger! Where, wow. where is Jennifer? <laughs> Jennifer, it looks like you're not in New York. You you are outside. Beautiful weather. Where are you now? <laughs> no, we cannot hear you. I'll unmute. Uh, um, hold on one second. People can unmute yourselves. And we want to make sure we get the final plating recommendations from Chef Debra, because I see that she has her stripes of peppers too. It wouldn't let me unmute. Sorry, we're in San Diego, California. San Diego, nice. Ooh. I can tell by the, by the weather, you know? So nice over there. <laughs> yeah, awesome. we, can't, we can't complain. We call this winter, but yeah. That's so cool. Your paella looks amazing, your arroz negro. Thank you. Well, we did it on the barbecue, so there's some some, so some extra fit. crispy edges, but the center looks That's fantastic. awesome. That's awesome. And Deborah, I, I love I love how the peppers look. It's so beautiful. And you put lemons on it, no? Yes. This can you can you bring that closer? Wow, this is so nice. I love it. I love it. I love the color, it's, the contrast of color. Traditional. <laughs> It's so beautiful. This is so awesome. Thank you. We, we all learned something new today. I love how many people actually made this dish. This is, ex that's so exciting. It's so exciting. Yeah. I love yeah. spreading I wanna, I the word see... on authentic Spanish food. Yeah, I want to see more, more dishes. Let's see, Deb. I, I look, Deb, Deb did the same thing you did. Deborah, look at nice. that. Nice. <laughs> This is so good. I want Let's to see. see. Let's see, Jennifer Alderton. Let's see, did you make the paella tonight? <laughs> I know that Brooke Webster and her group here representing Chicago were cooking along or planning to. No, it didn't come out. <laughs> you, needed, you needed some more tips from Chef. This is great. How about you, Mike? Did you cook the pie, the arroz negro tonight? Alas, I did not. I I was uh, ah, I, 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 I was not I, I was not in the kitchen this evening, oh, but okay. I did drink some wines along with uh, along with dinner. Of course, you I did, know, Mike. Your your favorite thing your favorite thing to eat from Deborah's kitchen is the ears. Yes, the orejas. The orejas. <laughs> Yes. Love the orejas. Absolutely. A, a specialty of, of Chef Deborah. If you go to, to Taberna de Aro, you will have these crispy ears that are absolutely delicious. I've I've been known to put away two plates by myself. One it's for true. one for dinner and one for dessert. <laughs> it's true. The one for dinner he pairs with wine, and the one for dessert he pairs with sherry. <laughs> <laughs> Solid point. And we're so excited, Chef, about your cookbook coming out, especially because a lot of these dishes that you make in your restaurant are so special and unique and things people would probably cook at their homes in Spain. How did you, how have you been sourcing your recipes all these years? Um, my, I, uh, 
this is the the promotional sample of my cookbook. It's just 20 pages long. I, I wish I could say we're on the verge of coming out, but I, I need a publisher. So it's not on the verge of coming out. But my photographer is amazing. Oh, look, the black rice right there. Um, I source my recipes based on what I most love from Spain and the dishes that I can replicate authentically in the United States. Uh, so I, I guess I have a selfish repertoire. I, I cook what I love the best and it needs to be authentic and it needs to be delicious and it needs to be replicatable in the United States. That's, that's my uh, basis for how I choose a recipe. So for example, a great dish to have in, in Galicia is sardines, like Atlantic sardines done so simply on the grill, olive oil, salt, parsley, lemon, things like that. I love to do because here we are on the Atlantic, the other side of the Atlantic, and we have great sardines. So, you know, I, I, I pull from Spain everything that I can, that I know I can replicate, you know, uh, faithfully so that I can keep being a good ambassador of authentic Spanish food at Taberno de Aro. And if, you can't, if you can't wait, we, we do recommend that you check out the El Camino del Abrino cookbook, which, like I said, Chef contributed a recipe to. If you've got leftover squid ink, you can use it for her recipe in our cookbook, which is calamares and sucinto, which is served with rice, but it's not a paella style dish. And it's amazing with, with Lerana Albarino, especially. Yeah. So nice. Deborah, thank you so much. My pleasure. It was so fun. It was wonderful. Does anyone have any questions? Well, we I need to visit you. We need to visit you, you know, and, and eat with you and buy your cookbook. You, it needs to be printed. You know, we we can support that cause. You know, we need you. We need you in more kitchens in, in America. <laughs> I, I'd love to be in more kitchens in America. That sounds fun. Mm. Totally. So it sounds fun. Does anyone have any questions that they want to ask? Chat no box questions. is blowing up. Lots of thank yous. Yeah, I was going to say no questions, but I, if, for those of you who are live in the Boston area and have not yet been to Taberna, um, it is like walking into a restaurant in Spain. It's like leaving the country for a couple of hours and 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 being in a, in a completely other place and, and the authenticity that that chef deborah brings to her kitchen and her entire experience um and the soul that's in all of her cooking is just something that warms my heart over and over again and and i am i am proud um to call her a friend and and glad that uh glad that gl glad that i'm able to visit on a reasonably regular basis thanks mike cheers <laughs> Some, fo some folks are asking about your sukkarat. They want to see if you oh, got them, if you want to show it to us. That's very personal. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's difficult eh, to do sukkarat. Nope. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Didn't well, get sukkarat this time. Let me try the other side. Yeah. Some areas no are different, no? Mm. Yeah. Flavor is still amazing though, even if you don't get it perfectly. Looks so good. It's delicious. I could go for a little sukarat and so Deborah, I have a personal question. If you were to choose one of the three wines for this dish, which will be your favorite? Um, that's a really hard question, Patrick. I think the Albarino to start and then the Goliardo. Let's see, I just ate a bite. Mm. For me, I love all of them. I think to me, each each brings a different quality of the dish. Um, the the Leirán Albariño to me is the one that amplifies the flavors the most. Um, the red Goliardo Tinto, it's a good pairing of contrast. You have this tart flavor 
and the sweetness of the dish, of the starch, and this contrast of tartness and sweetness is very interesting. And then I like the lemon, the lemon of Verroya with this See, dish. you can't so, decide either. You asked me to decide and you can't you see, decide no, either. No, no, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I agree with you. It's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Yeah. It's really, it's really tough. Um, I think the Leirana first for the first half of the meal and then the Goliardo second half of the meal and the Berroya while you're preparing the meal and eating some olives and some potato chips. That's great. There you go. Good. Well, well, thank you, everyone. Yeah. We thank you for joining our last uh, Olena Regatta experience of 2021. I can't think of anyone with whom we'd rather uh, close this year out. So thank you so much. Um, chef, and thank you so much to Lawyers for Civil Rights and for Yvonne for taking some time to tell, tell us all about your work tonight. We're, uh, we're hopeful that you'll stay in touch with Elena Obrigado, that you'll follow us on social media, and that you'll sign up for our newsletter so that you know in advance when next year's experiences will start coming through and you can keep supporting great causes, keep learning how to prepare incredible dishes. Chef, we hope you'll join us again. Uh, in Absolutely. The um, and thank you again for, for showing us how to make this very special dish. It is my pleasure. It's been really, really fun. Um, great idea to do this, to include more people in, in Spanish food and Spanish wine and loved it. Count me in every time. Thank you all so much. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Thanks Patrick for, for leading the charge. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Nice to see you, Jeffrey and Brooke and... Mike, everyone, it's so nice. We we will do we will re restart our series next year. So happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Happy holidays. I hope that Santa is good to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see you next year. Cheers. Don't forget to Cheers. check. Don't forget to check your email. Cheers. Um, we also, just speaking of Santa, uh, we were very generously offered a, a discount code from our friends at Despania. So if you want to make this dish again, or you want to keep making Spanish dishes, that code will be in your email that you'll see later this evening, along with the giveaway. Thank you all so much. Hope to see you in 2022. Bye. Happy Bye, everyone. Holidays, Thanks everyone. for joining. Gracias, <laughs> Débora. Muchas gracias. El placer ha sido mío. Muchas gracias a ti por incluirme.